All right, well, good morning. It's uh, 9.50, and this is probably about all the people I want to embarrass myself in front of anyway. So thanks for coming. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about high performance OpenStack for science and data analytics in a hybrid cloud environment. Very long title. Um, the content's actually not as long as the title. Uh, Stephen Carter. Um, we've got Jason Grimm and Josh, Lothi Josh Lothian. We're all from Cisco Systems. Uh, all of us have in past lives been HPC practitioners. Um, and so now at Cisco, we tend to help customers do HPC things on clouds. We all know that <clears throat> OpenStack is, is useful for doing science. Uh, the, the problem is that OpenStack is a constantly evolving, constantly changing animal. If you're always looking for that next feature to tweak your performance just a little bit, uh, you risk having multiple science experiments. Your primary science experiment like genomics and your secondary science experiment like OpenStack, right? Um, we really believe that as it stands today and really as it stood for the last year, um, along with other public cloud environments, uh, it's, it's, it's very conducive to doing science. It's just you kind of have to do things maybe a little bit differently. Uh, so what we'd ask is, is maybe a little bit of attention. We'll go over what we've done with our customers and hopefully that information will help Either you, if you are a computer scientist uh, trying to run science on clouds, or if you have users trying to run science on clouds. Uh, two points of order, actually. Uh, we have, uh, some of our slides are, are eye charts, really, right, because they're heat templates and whatever, and I'm not sure if you're going to read them, read them all that well. The, the, when they post the videos, what we intend to do is make a comment with, with a link to where you can get the slides and some of the templates and, and to use as reference material, right? Because you're probably not going to remember much of this anyway. It's all, it's all a blur with everything else you're seeing. Uh, the other thing is, um, at, at my heart, I'm actually still pretty much a network guy, and I try to infuse humor into my talks. The problem is I send all of my humor via UDP, so I don't really know if you get it or not. So. See, that, that usually only works in a network crowd, so you got clearly some network people in here. <clears throat> really the goal of this presentation is to help people get science done, right? Um, you know, let's, let's not worry about the infrastructure too much. Uh, we're going to go over uh, things to watch for, right, when, when you're using clouds, particularly around networking and storage, how to run workloads on these clouds. Uh, we're not going to get too in-depth, right? We've got 40 minutes, we can't cure, ca cure cancer, but, but maybe some of the information learned here can help others cure cancer and we will take credit for it. Science in the cloud, why, right? There's a lot of old school HPC practitioners like, you know, that doesn't compute. Um, the, the problem is that there's this explosion of data across all disciplines and, and uh, many of these disciplines are trying to analyze these da this data and there aren't enough HPC clusters out there, frankly, and so they're going to all sort of platforms. They're taking uh, resources from wherever they can get it. And if, but if you think about it, HPC workloads, right, depending on how you define HPC, I usually say HPC with a small H maybe, are very conducive to cloud. Cloud, one of the, one of the tenets of cloud is uh, scalability, uh, statelessness, right? So HPC workloads have been one of the, one of the first stateless workloads out there. You, you bring in the state, you compute, and you, you, you spin it all down, right? Um, you, you can achieve economies of scope with other cloud companies. So you've got companies like Google and Facebook and eBay developing uh, mechanisms to scale software, to, to cloud scale, right, to, to massive scale. If you use these mechanisms, you can take compute workloads and scale them to massive scale. And, and science is multidisciplinary. It's not necessarily, especially nowadays, it's not about putting an HPC uh, thing in a corner and doing some, some work on it. It's really about collaborating. It's about taking in data. It's about disseminating data. Uh, there are many things that you have to do other than compute. And so in a cloud environment that, in a cloud environment in which you can do these computational workloads, you can also use this infrastructure to do the collaboration, to do all of the other parts of what science is nowadays. The difference is that it tends to be very data intensive and compute and memory intensive. So when, you, when, you, when you're looking at hybrid cloud usage, right, I mean, there, there's, there's goodness in the hybrid cloud. You, you put the workload where it needs to be. The problem in the public cloud component of the hybrid cloud is they really tailor, they don't tailor to this use case, right? They don't tailor to the high CPU, the high memory, the large data movement. So if you're, if you're not using the right part of the cloud in the right way, you're going to get big bills and potentially bad performance. And that's why hybrid cloud's a good thing because, again, you put the workload in the place that's most conducive to undertaking that workload. 
And it's not so much batch, right? A lot of the cloud technologies out there are more streaming than they are batch. Um, but you can, you can still do batch. And uh, you know, one of the things we work on that we don't cover in this talk is really making your, your, your application, the core of your application, more cloud native and using, be, to be able to use things like Kubernetes and streaming analytics and such. Uh, when, you know, this is sort of a first step. We're not asking you to go rewrite all your applications to make them more cloud native. It's about meeting the application where it is. But you can still infuse cloud principles into how you use the cloud. And one of those is uh, portability, right? Write your application, your workflow in such a way that it can be portable. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Elastic, make sure that it can scale, make sure that it can grow to, to, to consume these resources that might be available to you for bursting into the cloud, for example. And, and infrastructure agnostic. Um, there, there is certainly value. I'm not trying to, to dissuade uh, you know, the science projects of making better infrastructure. That is, that is goodness all around, right? But it is in itself kind of a science. Um, if you're really wanting, if, if you're wanting to adopt cloud principles, most cloud native applications, they don't really care what infrastructure they run on, right? It's about the application, it's not about the infrastructure. So take that mindset, make your application, make your scientific application about the application and not the infrastructure. And, you know, don't be a hero, right? Small tweaks to a cluster will, will yield good results, but large tweaks, again, they yield a, a science experiment. So leave the science experiments for what they need to be, but when you're trying to undertake science, uh, maybe take a, a more pragmatic approach. Use it, use it where you can, use the optimizations where you can, um, but where you have to get things done, where you have to get science done, uh, take a more pragmatic approach. And it's about, you know, for us, it's not about optimizing time to solution, a particular time to solution for one workload. It's really about, if you're an, if you're an institution, it's about optimizing time to science. It's about scientific output, and it's about giving people access to the resources they need to undertake their scientific workloads. And I promise I will not spend that same amount of time on every single slide. This is an example workflow we worked with. Uh, we did two of them in this for this particular material. One is a, a whole genomic sequencing pipeline. The other one's a farmer job. But it's it's very much it's very similar to many many workflows. Um, and that pointer does not do anything on that screen, does it? <clears throat> to many workloads, right? So in, in this case, we have an alignment from from alignment in, in the alignment phase. We take a reference genome and we take the genome of a person. Did, did, does anybody know NA12878 by any chance? That's, yeah, it's actually me. The, this researcher promised he could, he could cure my, my male pattern baldness if they did some analysis on my genes. But it's a UDP. I don't even really know if you got that or not. <laughs> so there's some initial data that you pull in, right? And then it's, it's a pipeline of several tools. It's a tool, tool chain. And, and the, the first tool follow, you know, feeds the second tool, second tool, second, and, and the next tool, next tool, and then it, it puts it into to objects, it, it puts it into storage, right? We, we use object storage in the, in, in the form of Swift in this particular uh, experiment. Um, and then that's where you kind of, you can collaborate and, and disseminate data and, and, and interact with, with participants in the program, really. So that, that's just sort of the, that, that's very much like pretty much all the jobs that are run in this sort of space in the kind of embarrassingly parallel, loosely coupled, coupled space that, that tends to be very good for, uh, for cloud. If we start looking at some of the bottlenecks to avoid, it, you know, this, this first <clears throat> on the left is, is what you'll usually find in a OpenStack uh, cluster, right? Now, you know, especially when that's not tuned. Um, you, you end up having some network node. That network node could either be a silicon-driven node, a hardware node, or software node. Often it tends to be software node. Um, the problem is you, you can run into some bottlenecks there, right? Software is great, NFP is great, but, but in general it tends to be about a thousand times slower than its, than its, equivalent, hardware, uh, uh, its equivalent hardware component. Um, you can try to address this with scale, but, but you know, again, when people do OpenStack, it's hard enough it is, as it is to get it up and going. You know, they might not have tweaked it. You still want it to be useful, though. So just be cognizant that that network node could be a bottleneck. Um, you know, tenant to tenant, you also go through that network node by default. Uh, where you don't go through the network node is within your tenant network, right? So within a tenant, you tend to not be exposed to that network node as a bottleneck. Uh, depending on your overlay could add an, a bottleneck, right? But we won't get into that. But, you know, generally that's going to be your best bandwidth uh, node to node. Uh, there's, you know, of late you've been, you've had distributed virtual router as an option. Distributed virtual router helps out quite a bit. 
um, in that tenant to tenant, it's handled locally. Uh, uh, source NAT, you still kind of you still go through that router, uh, but floating IP, uh, you don't, right? So that could be a way of getting around the bottleneck. So if you have data transfer nodes, for example, you might give them the floating IP so they can pull data in and out, whether you have a formal data transfer node or something like Globus on it, or just a node that you end up doing your FTPs from. Um, and then on the right is, is what we find uh, that we have the most success with, and that's just a simple, plain old provider VLAN or, or just a provider network, generally in, in the form of provider VLAN. And so you don't have to worry about any of this. You, you kind of expose to the VLAN um, and you get kind of full bandwidth to your, to your instance. Um, If we go over storage, it's, it's important to know your path to how you're using that storage. If, if you're using ephemeral, that's generally local. That's local to the node. So if you're using ephemeral for, for scratch, you're reaching down into the, into the node's hardware. If you've got fast disk, a nice RAID or SSDs or a combination of the two, you'll get some pretty good performance. You don't have to worry about any of these bottlenecks. If you use Cinder, now it's not, this is not you know, a, an absolute statement, but generally Cinder is accessed via NFS or iSCSI or something over the back end network of the node. So you don't have to worry about bottlenecks from the Neutron router because it's not one of the tenant networks. Um, so if you have like dual 10 gigs or dual 40 gigs, you can generally get some pretty good bandwidth to storage. Um, if you're using, where this is not an absolute statement, like for example, some, some uh, OpenStack clusters will use a converged uh, storage, right? So they'll run Ceph on the same as, as the compute. So sometimes your sender actually might be local, um, which, which could also have another, another aspect of goodness. And then when you're trying to access shared storage, for example, Swift or NFS or Gluster, this is when you have to worry about your network bottlenecks, right? So a, lot of, a lot of HPC jobs still use some sort of shared POSIX file system to get data to write out results. Um, and just you have to be cognizant that when you mount that file system, when you do I.O. to that, that uh, uh, shared file system, that you're doing it in such a way to avoid these network bottlenecks. If we look at uh, flows, right, so da HPC uh, data workflows, that is how you get your data, how you put out your data, um, this is the, the object storage tends to be good in a cloud environment. Um, mostly because you decouple yourself from a POSIX file system. You can still use a POSIX, or I should say a shared POSIX file system. You can still use a POSIX file system for your scratch base, right? That doesn't really stop your, your job portability, but if you're thinking about portability, you might not want to have your application just always assume there's a shared file system and mount it, because if you want to move that to Amazon or some other public cloud or community cloud, that file system is not going to be available to mount. But if you get your data via object storage, Swift, for example, which is very often co-located with uh, an OpenStack thing, uh, you can ingest that data, operate on that data, use local scratch, and then exfiltrate that data to your object storage. And, and this way, you know, say you have a Swift cluster at your institution, you can push your jobs in any cloud, and it's, it's a pull, right? You pull that object out of your cluster with the appropriate authentication and whatnot into, for example, Amazon, where you don't pull for, you don't, you don't get charged for pulling data into, right? You do your work, um, you get that data out of there, so you're not charged for the, the storage, now you're charged to get data out of Amazon. Um, but still, it's actually a good, it's a good mechanism for job portability and kind of most conducive, uh, you know, financial model with respect to doing your workloads. You've also got, as I mentioned, shared file systems, so you can certainly co-locate an OpenStack cluster with a shared file system like Lustre or GPFS or Lustre or, or PVFS or whatever. Um, uh, and that works perfectly fine. It's just, it, it does limit your portability and you have to worry about the bottlenecks a little bit. Uh, and then there's a shared virtual file system that some of the tools that we present that you could use uh, will actually spin up some of these, right? So if you, if, you, if you take advantage of the fact that generally within a tenant network, you have very, you know, very, very many fewer, if that's correct grammar, um, bottlenecks, essentially what you do is when you spin up your worker nodes, you might also spin up, you know, we, we kind of demonstrate spinning up some slurm scheduling nodes. Um, you can sc spin up some Gluster nodes, all of which use local ephemeral storage and stitch that together as a shared file system. And, and this helps for things like genomics. So, so genomics uh, pipelines, they tend to have, you know, you, you end up do, uh, 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 processing these genomes that come in, right, uh, that you have to do this, this se sequencing on. You compare them against reference genomes and actually a lot of reference files. So instead of if you have 10 workers or 100 workers, instead of each one of those 100 workers 
pulling in those files separately, you can basically make a shared file system, a temporary shared file system in this virtual environment, pull it down there, and then all share it between the workers, right? And they might they might they might pull the genomes out of object storage, and 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 even the the shared stuff in the in shared of the shared data and shared file system might be pulled out of ob object storage. And then just for completeness, we haven't actually tested this one. The uh, in the kilo time frame, they, you're supposed to have put in multi mount for volume. So you know, technically, if you have this reference data, you can have it out there in a volume, and all of these. Uh, uh, instances can mount it and you can they can all sort of use that uh, common reference point now we get into launching workloads uh, you know we, we tried to be pretty simple pretty pretty simple pretty pragmatic and pretty portable um, in, in all of these we cover basically three three different mechanisms for starting workload the first is the easiest right a, a bash shell script um, or you know whatever shell script of your choice, Python, you know whatever you want really. Um, but most of these cloud infrastructures, OpenStack, AWS, Azure, Google, um, have APIs, and you can simply uh, write a script to launch your workload in in this. It, it's it's quick, it's dirty, it's easy to do. Um, it's not quite as flexible, you know. So you might have to do you have to do a lot of your, your roll your own. Uh, cluster if you want to do things like schedulers or, or shared file systems, but it's easy. It's good, it's good for a quick and easy test. It's also not very dynamic. You, you know, pretty much you're going to uh, uh, spin it up. You kind of have to know when your job's done, and then you pull it back down. Uh, and then we, and Heat. Uh, Heat's nice because it's built in to OpenStack. It's pretty capable. Uh, you know, you can, you can access it via CLI, Web UI, or GUI. Uh, but basically, we spin up a cluster uh, with heat using, uh, and we, we put a, a cluster, uh, not a cluster, a Slurm controller, right, for your batch scheduler and then a bunch of Slurm workers. Uh, it, it's good because it it's, takes a little bit more of the do-it-yourself off of you, right? So the, the putting into a template is just a little bit easier than writing all the bash scripts, uh, the scripting. Um, uh, yourself, uh, the, it's the where it kind of is not so great. It's a really good sort of day zero and and take it down, right? It's not really heat's not really good for maintaining something. So it's really about spinning up a cluster, doing something, bringing it down the cluster. But luckily, that's what most HPC jobs look like anyway. And then uh, Elastic Cluster is uh, what we what we also did uh, kind of an example. There are other tools, for example, Star Cluster. Um, uh, Elastic Cluster seems to have a lot of good capabilities in it, um, mostly just an example. But but Elastic Cluster is a tool, and, and this is sort of you know cl being kind of infrastructure agnostic. It's a tool that you can point at different infrastructures, use the same way to spin up a cluster. It has a lot of Ansible playbooks for Slurm and and SGE and Gluster. Um, that are kind of built in, and so you can bring up a cluster, launch some jobs in it, and pull down that cluster. And so that's what I'll go over now. So if we look at Bash, it's pretty simple, right? Um, I'd use my pointer, but we established it's not useful on these screens. But basically, you know, you're, you're setting up uh, your environmental variables for things like your key and the image you want to use and the network you want to put it on. And then um, over here, right, we have to figure out a way to stick that job into the, the node, right? And so we do that with cloud init. Cloud init is how you get your key in there and your name and your other things. Um, we're halfway through, I've only lost one person so far. That's not too bad. Um, that's, that's much better than last time. That was a disaster. <laughs> uh, so we have to figure out a way to get workloads in there. And so we have this cloud init script. Um, I've actually been waiting for someone to leave so I can use that bit. <laughs> um, we have this cloud init script focus, Stephen. Um, we have this cloud init script that basically gets pushed into the uh, uh, the instance, and then you run it to set up your environment and launch launch the workload. And then we you, you know have here some more bash some some more bash here that we call the Nova boot in you know your favorite control loop. Um, so you spin it up, you run it. The thing here is that you. Nova doesn't really know whether your job's finished or not. It just kind of knows the stuff's there. And so what you want to make sure you do is when you're done, you put that result someplace where you can see and say, okay, well, I've seen all 100 of my nodes kind of report back that it's done. I'll bring down these, this cluster, right? So it's, again, it's quick and dirty, but it's, it's probably you know, not the most capable. Now we've got heat. Um, you know, heat is is good. It's, it, it takes another. It's another step up in complexity. Another step up in capability. Uh, what we see here is is kind of very similar to when we set the environmental ver environmental variables in the Bash script. 
Uh, we kind of set the, kind of the, the, the instance type we want, the network to put it on, the keys we're going to use, and then we start set, uh, defining resources like our Slurm controller resources and then our Slurm uh, uh, compute resources, defining, uh, again, basically some cloud init that we use to bring up um, uh, these nodes, right, to basically provision the nodes, add them to Slurm, and, and mount stuff. Uh, you, you can leave. This one hurts a little bit more because he's actually on my team, you know. <laughs> That actually does make me a little sad. Um, and so we d define our resources. Um, uh, we define the resource, and these resources are things that spin up, like a, a Slurm control node or a Slurm compute node or, or what have you. Um, and then, again, more, more of the same. Uh, and then adding security groups, right, because you don't want to just kind of put this stuff out for anything, uh, for anybody to, 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 to poke at. Uh, a asking for a floating IP for the Slurm controller, the head node, right? Um, and then finally we go and we capture, we, we, we launch some, some compute nodes, capture the output because when you run this you want to get the IP address back of your head node so you don't have to go searching for it, right? And then you can log in there and you can launch jobs with Slurm or whatever, you, whatever batch schedule you want. You can also set up cluster nodes, you can set up data transfer nodes. You, you can do a lot with Heat and it's there. It's you know, generally there in, in most of the OpenStack clusters you're going to be doing. And this is, this is a, an example of launching the stack uh, from the CLI, but again, you, you know, you got heat uh, integrated into the GUI, and so this is that same stack launched, and you can kind of see some nice graphs, and you can sort of see the resources that are up and the status, and you can, uh, you know, pull that cluster down when you're done. Last but not least, Elastic Cluster. Uh, again, so this is one of many tools. There's, there are a couple of tools like this. Uh, but but it is a piece of code. Uh, you go ahead and you define some things, right? So in, in this particular case, we've defined that, uh, that we've found the cloud we're going to talk to, right? So we're, we're, we're provider OpenStack. It could be provider AWS, uh, for example, if you want to sort of push, you want to aim it into the cloud for, for more of a hybrid cloud approach. You give uh, uh, username and project name and, and you know, whether you request floating IP. Uh, you basically all the stuff that you need to, to, to define to point it to OpenStack. So OpenStack kind of, uh, you know, so the infrastructure, it knows how to treat that particular infrastructure. And then uh, log in for the, uh, for the nodes in, in the cloud. Uh, it has, it, like I said, it comes with several playbooks. This is an Ansible Slurm playbook, so this will go out and run that playbook on the nodes to set up Slurm. It, ha it actually has an Ansible Gluster playbook, an SGE playbook, a couple of other playbooks. Um, so they've kind of you know, put a good bit of thought into this, and, and they use relatively new tools um, to do it. And then you set up the instances and whatnot. You know, it's a similar theme, right? So in, in Bash, we did this. We predefined all this. I mean, at the end of the day, in all the tools, you're going to have to tell the infrastructure what images you want to use, what flavors you're going to want to use, and, and whatnot. Um, in, in this particular scenario, uh, what we did was, or specifically what Josh did, because I, I didn't do any of this, frankly. So <laughs> unless it's good. If it's good, it was all me. Um, so we define... Uh, you know, how many nodes we have, and then uh, this, this kind of set up everything. So basically, he does an S run to start the job in Slurm, and Slurm goes and runs the script and all the nodes, and it sets up all the nodes and uh, uh, downloads whatever you need, right? It basically preps the nodes for this. Uh, when you launch it, you, you simply type Elastic Cluster Start Pharma. This was, this was a pharmaceutical job we were running for a customer. Um, and so that, so that basically instantiates this cluster. The Elastic, Elastic Cluster SF, SFTP farm is how he pushed out the script that he's going to use, right, that he's going to do the S run on. And then this batch script is, is what the job is, right? So this batch script will go and define some environment variables. Um, I don't think he pulls down it. I think he pushes everything out already, and then he kind of runs, runs the job at the end. Um, here, he's, he's Elastic Cluster SSH into that pharma node, uh, into that head node for, for pharma, and then uh, he fires up 256 uh, of these workers and sends them to Slurm. Now, the nice thing about this, so if, you, if you use Bash and you didn't use a scheduler, you kind of, you, you spin up what you need, right? There's no batching there. Um, with both Heat and with this, you can let Slurm take care of that. You can use a lot of the same sort of batch system mechanics that you've used for uh, what you do today, probably, right? And then you can bring it down with the last cluster stop pharma.
And again, it's, it's not necessarily about getting the completion job of one very high. Really, it's about, okay, this, you, your institution has bought, has put money into these resources to do science. Um, and we want to do as much science on those resources as possible. So what we do is we, we load this up with as many cloud jobs as possible. This, this right, right here, we've actually got HT still turned on. We've got oversubscription. We, we're going to run some more with HT turned off. Uh, Hyperthreading, right? So hyperthreading is not always great for these types of jobs. Um, oversubscription is not always great for these types of jobs. So even, you know, it, it, you know, that little bit of tweaking that I'm talking about, you could do some tweaking and have a different aggregate of servers that are slightly more conducive to the compute workloads, for example. That's pretty easy, different BIOS settings, different oversubscription and such. Um, but really it's about, you know, 99.8% utilization on this cluster. If you're going to spend money to do on, the, on this cluster, you give, you, you know, give it to as, as many of your scientists as possible as an asset, as, as a resource. And so it does scale well in that respect. Now, a little bit about uh, hybrid cloud. Uh, you know, there's, there's basically two ways to do hybrid cloud. And, you know, we, we help folks set up, you know, hybrid cloud infrastructures a lot. Um, if you're an institution and you want to say, okay, well, we're, we're going to be using Amazon or some other public cloud for, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. Either we might put steady state in there, we might use it for burst, but we just kind of want to plumb that network uh, to go into some public cloud. There's, there's a couple of easy ways to do that, right? Uh, Amazon has uh, Direct Connect, and you can take that, you can take Direct Connect and terminate it at some institutional border, right, if you are the institution doing it. If you're a user, you could either spin up an NFV in Amazon or use Amazon's, I mean, you might not have the capabilities in the Amazon account, you might share it with other folks, right? So you might not be able to bring up a direct connect, but you can usually spin up an NFV uh, of some sort in that VPC and you can spin up an NFV. It might all, you might, you know, your, your, your cluster might support VPN as a service, for example, or you can just sort of ad hoc spin up an NFV and bring up an IPsec tunnel, right? So you can bring up a path, a network path between your work, your your local workload and your cloud workload, and you can kind of look at it as one big cluster. And and there's there are, you know, there are times when that's very useful. Um, you have to keep in mind, obviously, the kind of non non uniform access of your public cloud as opposed to your private cloud. Getting data up there might take longer. It might take you know might might t take shorter time if that's where your data re resides. It might take longer to get it locally. Um, but you know that's one way to do it, right? But but if you're really talking about cloud, and again, and, and you know if you're making your apps cloud ready, right? We're not talking about rewriting your apps at this point to make them truly cloud native. But if you're if you're making your HPC apps cloud ready, you not might not need any of this extension, right? Because if you've packaged it properly, and and you know containers um, containers are also a big part of making it cloud native, but just not having to install an environment every single time you want to go into another cloud. It, you can spin up new instances and make them available as Amis or, or, images on, or, or images on your OpenStack, but if you can just use regular baseline images and do the least amount of possible to them, then it, it makes your life easier, less you have to do. Uh, so Genomics, for example, Genomics has like uh, 100 tools. Uh, that are used in a hundred different ways for a hundred different reasons, right? And depending on what you want to do, uh, they it could take you forever to install all these dependencies. And, and so you can you know you can solve that with Docker, not 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 containers for being able to run multiple workloads on the same instance, right? Uh, but really for packaging, and for genomics in particular, there's a bio Docker. Uh, project and they've basically taken a lot of these tools and 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 dockerized them with with a known sort of input and output type mechanism and what you can do is you can just call your tool you don't put your workload in a container but you just do a docker run on that do on that docker container with the input and the output and you don't have to worry about uh, doing any of your tools right so this takes off a lot of the burden from you about trying to make the the target environment useful for your application you just make your application portable so look to way Look to ways to make your application as portable as possible. Don't try to tailor to the infrastructure. Um, and then storage. Again, we kind of talked about this before, but if you use object storage, like Swift, for example, um, you can make that available from your institution, or, I mean, you can use it from S3, or, you know, object storage is pretty plentiful nowadays. There's lots of tools you can use to interact with object storage. If you make it so that you can pull that object from anywhere 
and put that object to anywhere. You don't have to worry about mounting file systems. And at the very, you know, at the very worst, you you could you could, you spin up a virtual cluster like we talked about in that cloud to temporarily use it and then pull it down, right? Because again, the public clouds, the, their their economics are hard to beat when you're talking about spot price and you're talking about just burst burst, burst workloads. So assuming that it's ephemeral anyway, you can spin it up, do what you need to do, and bring it down, right? And then, and then launching. Um, you know, if you use infrastructure infrastructure agnostic ways to launch your jobs, I mean, Bash is one of those, right? It's not necessarily the most flexible and, and capable. I mean, depending on your, you know, your 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 level of, of Bash awesomeness. Um, but you can call. They all have CLIs, right? So you can call the CLI of any, and you can you can choose, for example, to use the the EC2. API for your OpenStack cluster and just treat everything as an EC2 something and just point it to different zones whether it's a, or different regions, whether it's a local one or, or a, a remote one. Uh, cloud formation, you can use that instead of heat now, but the problem is when you get into these specific templating languages, and I understand that they can kind of cross-pollinate in some sense, right? But if you start using infrastructure specific templating, you're kind of on that infrastructure. Um, and so it's, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do, but you might want to keep an eye towards infrastructure agnostic, agnosticism. Um, and ElastiCluster, right? So that's one of the things we liked about ElastiCluster, you can just sort of point it at a different back end. You do the same thing every single time. You don't have to worry about much of the infrastructure. It takes a lot of that um, worry for you. Um, and so really, you know, hybrid cloud is not really all that difficult. You, again, you can pin up the infrastructure. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to if you do your applications properly. Uh, and then, uh, kind of last is is are the batch schedulers. Some of the batch schedulers actually have mechanisms for hybrid cloud, right? So some of them are, are you, you spin up some instances in Amazon, for example, and you put them to sleep. And then when the batch scheduler gets to some sort of threshold, it'll spin those up and and launch some workloads in them and spin them down, right? So, so your batch scheduler could actually help you uh, with, with private cloud. So that's what we have for you today. Um, hopefully that was useful. Uh, hopefully this is a, a pragmatic approach to doing science in the cloud that either you can use uh, for your own work or maybe that you can help some of your, uh, your customers use. Uh, love any questions, any comments. Uh, just to kind of steer our work in the future. So thanks for your time.